Welcome to the International Express to Book Central. Departing now. Grab a seat, settle in, and let's while away the journey with some book chat. Hi there! Thank you for joining me today on the Train to Book Central. I'm your host, Jules. Each week, while we travel along on this train, we will discuss a book, or a short story, or maybe a poem, and most definitely, some medieval literature. I'll tell you something of the plot, and then discuss some of my favourite aspects of whatever it is we just read. These episodes will of course contain heavy spoilers, as well as shock horror gasp, context and subtext, so be warned. Have you ever wondered how the whole vampire thing really got started? Did vampires always glitter? And are they always men out to seduce young innocent women? If you've ever asked yourself these questions, then I have the book for you. Today we're discussing Carmilla by Irish author Sheridan Le Fanu. First published in 1872, This short novella predates Bram Stoker's Dracula by 25 years and features a rather seductive female vampire. Before we get into it, it's worth quickly discussing old books which were exciting when they came out. Certain twists have become so famous that you don't even have to read the book to know them. Think of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde being the same person, for example, or the role of the nanny in Henry James's The Turn of the Screw. These things were new and mind-blowing when they came out, and they changed the way stories were told. Now we know these twists, though, and going back to the original book can feel a little dry because the suspense is no longer really there. The same is kind of true for Camilla. A lot of the novel's suspense relies on what Camilla is, and the characters around her are potentially a little too naive for a modern reader. The same is actually also true for poor Jonathan Harker in Stoker's Dracula. That man wouldn't recognise a vampire if he bit him. It's worth sticking with these classics though, because as I hope to show you, they have plenty more to give than just their twists. So let's dive into Camilla and try not to get bitten. Here are the opening lines. Prologue. Upon a paper attached to the narrative which follows, Dr. Hesalius has written a rather elaborate note, which he accompanies with a reference to his essay on the strange subject which the manuscript illuminates. Yes, Carmilla starts with a frame story of someone, someone, who we don't know, who received a mysterious manuscript from a Dr. Hesalius. This manuscript tells a strange tale on a strange subject, which, according to Dr. Hesalius, involves some of the profoundest arcana of our dual existence. What this may mean, we do not know, until the narrative itself begins on the next page. So here are the opening lines of that narrative. In Styria, we, though by no means magnificent people, inhabit a castle, or schloss. A small income in that part of the world goes a great way. Eight or nine hundred a year does wonders. Scantily enough, ours would have answered amongst wealthy people at home. My father is English, and I bear an English name, although I never saw England. But here, in this lonely and primitive place, where everything is so marvellously cheap, I really don't see how ever so much more money would at all materially add to our comforts, or even luxuries. This narrative is told to us by an as yet unnamed young woman, who once lived in Styria, a part of southeastern Austria. She has a story to tell about events which took place eight years ago, when she was only 19 years old. At the time of the story, she lived in a solitary castle with her father, a good-natured governess called Madame Perdon, and a finishing governess, Mademoiselle de La Fontaine. Her mother sadly passed away at the girl's birth, and so this group of four makes up the only residence, aside from a few visitors here and there. Our narrator had a relatively peaceful, if lonesome, childhood, but one event stands out sharply in her memories. When she was young, perhaps only six years old, she once woke up in the middle of the night to find herself alone. Before she could begin to cry, 
she saw a beautiful young lady look down at her, who gently caressed her and then crawled into bed with her. When she feels something sharp stab into her breast, however, the young girl begins to scream and the mystery lady disappears. It must have all been a dream, or a nightmare, everyone tells her so, but they nonetheless call over a priest who prays with them all for a long time. This is long in the past, however, and although it is not forgotten, our young narrator has something exciting to look forward to, a visit by her father's friend, General Spielsdorf, and his niece, Bertha. As she takes a stroll with her father and governesses, he informs her, though, that he has received the most upsetting letter from the general, and that there will be no visit for some time. The niece has suddenly and mysteriously died, and in his letter the general raves about his mission to extinguish the monster that caused her death. They all take in the beautiful evening around them as they ponder this melancholy news. Mademoiselle de La Fontaine can't help but comment on the intense moonlight, and predicts that some spiritual activity is afoot. Her musings are interrupted by distant sounds of a carriage in haste. It comes barreling down from the high ground, accompanied by four riders. Just before it crosses the bridge past the castle, the horses spook and the carriage flips. A stern but noble-looking woman emerges unscathed, but the riders lift a young woman out of the carriage. Our narrator can't see her face, but she's clearly unconscious. The older woman doesn't know what to do. On the one hand, she has to keep going on her wild journey. It's a very urgent mission, apparently. On the other hand, there is no way the young woman, who is her daughter, will be able to travel right away. Our narrator begs her father to let the young woman stay with them, and the mother finally accepts. She tells the father, though, that her daughter shall not be able to share any details about where she comes from and who they are. The mother swiftly departs, and the young woman is brought into the castle and checked over by a local doctor. Our narrator can't wait to meet her, but when she finally gets to see her, she is in for a major shock. The young woman looks exactly like the beautiful lady who appeared to our narrator in her dream. Struck with horror, our narrator is not quite sure what to feel or what to do, until the visitor feels that she herself had a similar dream 12 years ago, in which she saw our narrator. The visitor is called Carmilla, and our narrator quickly gets over her shock. Carmilla is beautiful and gentle, and the two feel bonded by their shared dream experience. Perhaps they were destined to be friends. There is something odd about Carmilla, though, and our narrator feels at once drawn to her and repulsed by her. Carmilla has beautiful long hair, and she is charming, but there is also a languor about her and she absolutely refuses to tell our narrator anything about her or her mother. There is a coldness in her eyes when it comes to these topics. Our narrator knows only three things for sure. Her name is Carmilla, her family is ancient, and her home is somewhere west from here. And sometimes Camilla gets into weird, amorous moods where she embraces our narrator and murmurs passionate declarations of affection into her ear. Our narrator doesn't know what to do in these moments, but she's also lulled into a trance by them. Our narrator has grown up very alone, so she has no experience with these things. Maybe Camilla is a boy in disguise come to declare his love. Nonsense, our narrator tells herself. Camilla probably just has a nervous and dramatic disposition. One afternoon, the two are sitting on a bench in the castle park when a funeral procession for a young village woman who recently died unexpectedly passes by. To show her respect, our narrator joins their hymn, which infuriates Camilla. She hates the sound of it all, and a brief flash of anger passes over her face. Our narrator only sees her angry one more time, when a hunchback visits the castle, selling trinkets and offering entertainment. When he glances at the two young women in the window, he offers them charms to protect them against the upir. They both buy charms, but when he gets a closer look at Camilla, his comments seem to offend her. That same day, the narrator's father informs them that another young peasant woman has fallen ill and is now dying. It seems something is going around, and both the narrator and Camilla are very scared. What if they get ill? Soon after, they receive a visit from a picture cleaner, who is tasked with cleaning up all the ancient paintings in the castle. As he unpacks the paintings, he reveals a portrait that was previously all covered in grime and dust. 
It is a picture of Mircalla, Countess of Karnstein, who died in 1698. She is the spitting image of Camilla, and so the young woman reveals that she is indeed descended from the Karnsteins. When the two young women afterwards go for a stroll, Camilla seems to confess a deep love for our narrator, but she also seems a little unwell. Camilla blames her languid nature and quickly recovers, while our narrator chalks up her confession to this odd nature of hers. Camilla hasn't heard anything from her mother, meanwhile, and she does offer to go after her, having relied upon our narrator and her father long enough. Neither will hear anything of Camilla leaving, though, and so she happily agrees to stay on longer. That night, however, our narrator has a strange dream, which she says is the beginning of a very strange agony. It seems like a dark animal, almost a monstrous cat, is moving back and forth in her bedroom before springing up onto the bed. Then it feels like two sharp needles enter our narrator's chest, and she screams. Suddenly, instead of a dark animal shape, she sees a woman standing at the foot of her bed, who then changes places closer and closer to the door until she disappears. The next morning, our narrator tells Madame Perdon and Mademoiselle La Fontaine of her night, not wanting to alarm her father, and the two comfort her. Apparently, weird things are afoot all around, as the walkway outside Camilla's window is also haunted by the figure of a woman, frightening a farmhand out of his wits. Camilla had a terrifying night visitation herself, but she was protected by the charm she pulled from the hunchback earlier. She recommends that our narrator keep hers close from now on, and she does indeed have deep and dreamless nights from then on. But there is a certain melancholy to her now every time she wakes up, She's not ill or in pain, but she feels somehow weaker. In her sleep, it feels like she's moving against the current of a river, as if she's in a dark place, and as if she's being slowly strangled. She refuses to tell her father about what is happening to her, but eventually he can see something is wrong, because she's growing pale and nervous. While Camilla also has weird dreams, she's nowhere near as affected as our narrator. Is this what the peasants warn for? Is this the upia? One night, our narrator has a different kind of dream, in which a sweet voice tells her, Your mother warns you to beware of the assassin. After which, she sees a vision of Carmilla covered in blood. She wakes up crying and rushes to Camilla's room, convinced something is wrong. The door is locked and no one answers. She has the door broken down, but Camilla is gone. The search goes on well into the next day when, suddenly, our narrator finds Camilla back in her room. She has no memory of what happened or how she got to the room, but thankfully the narrator's father finds the solution. Camilla used to walk in her sleep as a child, and that is exactly what she must have done on that night as well. He is relieved, but says he wishes his own Laura looked as well as Camilla. And that is how we find out that our narrator's name is Laura. Laura's father is officially worried, and he calls for the doctor, who carefully questions her. He is concerned as well, and calls for her father again. He asks that Laura show them her throat, and they find a blue mark there. He believes she can get well again, but he commands Madame Perdon to not leave Laura out of her sight for even a second. In order to take her mind of things, her father takes her on a trip to nearby Karnstein for some sightseeing. Karnstein is a village that was abandoned years ago, and the ruins must be quite a sight. Mademoiselle de La Fontaine and Camilla will join them there later that day for a picnic. And guess who they meet on the way? General Spielsdorf, who was just on his way to them. The man has aged with his grief, and Laura's father asks him to tell them what he can as he joins them to Karnstein. General Spielsdorf has strange things to tell both of the House of Karnstein, now extinct, and its abandoned village. But his tale starts with a masquerade ball, hosted by a friend of his, Count Karlsfeld, to which both the general and his niece Bertha were invited. Bertha had a great time there, wowed by the fireworks and the music. Also present was a masked young lady, accompanied by her stately mother, also masked, who seemed to have a keen interest in Bertha. The mother approached the general and revealed that the two had known each other years ago. She refused to reveal who she was or take off her mask, though, 
and as the two adults chit-chat and flirt, so do the two girls. The mother is eventually called away by a pale servant, who reveals that she has to leave straight away on an urgent errand. While she knows it is a lot to ask, the mother begs the general to look after her daughter for a few weeks until she has returned. Upon her return, she promises to reveal all. The general gives in, a little overwhelmed by this woman, I think, and so the young woman called Milaka joins them. All is well, except that Milaka is a bit odd. She locks her room at night, but is also seen wandering in the garden, apparently sleepwalking. Bertha also begins to feel unwell. She sees a beast stalk her bedroom and gets weird sensations of strangulation in her dreams. As Laura hears the story, she can't quite believe that she is hearing her own symptoms described. She doesn't quite connect the dots yet, though, as there's still a few more chapters to go, and so they arrive at the village of Karnstein. There, the general asks a local woodsman to point out the grave of Mirkala, Countess of Karnstein. The Karnsteins were a bad family, blood-stained, and the general intends to get his vengeance on them. How? Why? asks Laura. That family has been dead for ages. The woodsman can't locate the grave, but he promises to find an old man who has lived here for years who would know. He also tells them of the revenants, which haunted this village before it died out. It took the arrival of a Moravian nobleman, who sought out the final reverend to end this initial plague. As the woodsman heads off, the general reveals to his audience that no doctor was able to help his Bertha, until one told him that what he needed was a priest, because this is no illness, but a vampire's work. Despite this knowledge, the general is too late to save his niece, and Bertha dies. Malaka, meanwhile, disappeared. As he finishes his tale, Laura hears Mademoiselle de La Fontaine and Carmilla's voices approach. As Camilla comes closer, the general recognises her and jumps up. He grabs an axe and tries to go for her, but she grabs his arm and he has to let his axe fall, incapable of getting rid of her grip. With that, Camilla disappears, as if swallowed by the earth itself. The general confirms what we have all come to suspect. Melaka is Camilla, who is Mirkala, the Countess of Karnstein. After this shocking reveal, a strange-looking old man appears, who is able to locate the Countess's grave. The men return the next day with the commission and inquisition, and open up the grave. Inside the casket is the perfectly preserved body of the Countess, floating in blood with her eyes open. They drive a stake through her heart, after which she shrieks, and then they cut off her head. Finally, they burn her corpse and disperse the ashes in a river. And so comes an end to Laura's illness, and we are left with these lines. The following spring, my father took me on a tour through Italy. We remained away for more than a year. It was long before the terror of recent events subsided, and to this hour the image of Camilla returns to memory with ambiguous alternations. Sometimes the playful, languid, beautiful girl, sometimes the writhing fiend I saw in the ruined church, and often from a reverie I have started, fancying I heard the light step of Carmilla at the drawing-room door. And that is Carmilla by Sheridan Le Fanu, although you'd have to read it yourself for Le Fanu's beautiful descriptions. I did also skip over some of the vampire technicalities from the conclusion, which I'd love to discuss with you in the next section. Let's get one thing out of the way first. Vampires were of course not invented by Sheridan Le Fanu. Vampires have existed in folklore and mythology in some shape and form for centuries. We find mentions of vampire-like creatures in ancient Greek, Hebrew, Old Norse and Roman texts. Yet modern readers might not immediately recognize them as the vampire we know and maybe love today. Mesopotamian sources speak of a creature called Lilithu, who was then linked to the figure of Lilith in Hebrew demonology. Lilith is sometimes seen as Adam's first wife, who was a bit too feisty for him and therefore got cast out and replaced with Eve. It is said that upon being cast out of the Garden of Eden, Lilith survived in the blood of babies. Because of this, she also gets linked to the Greek figure of the Lamia, who also ate children. 
These kind of vampiric return from the dead figures also aren't just a European thing. There is, for example, the Susoyant, a blood-sucking hag from Caribbean folklore, or the Gasha Dokuro from Japan, who took on the form of a huge skeleton that ate people on the battlefield. The Akan people from Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire and Togo speak of the Sasabonsam, a figure with iron teeth that feeds on people that wander into its woods. While each of these creatures and figures is different, they all share the same element that they feed on human beings and are themselves either fully supernatural or deceased human beings come back to life. Another word for those returned from the dead is revenants, which also gets used in Camilla and which are the kind of figures we see very often in Old Norse literature. Today, though, we're dealing with the European figure, and the name itself gives us a clue of where the roots for this figure may lie. Vampire came to English from the German vampir, which in its own turn came from the Serbian word vampir. Sure, it hasn't changed much over time, but why fix what ain't broke? This Serbian word has loads of cognates throughout the Slavic languages, but its exact etymology isn't entirely certain. Some say it could come from the Gek Albanian word pir, which means to drink. Others say it might come from the Tatar word for witch, ubir. What we do know is that it first appeared in English in 1732, when it was used in news reports to describe vampire attacks or epidemics in Eastern Europe. The word has been unstoppable ever since. But I can hear you say, wait, there were vampire epidemics in the 18th century? At the end of Camilla, we are told of an inquisition and a commission who show up to perform the legal destruction of the vampire. This was most likely inspired by what some have dubbed the Great Vampire Epidemic in the second quarter of the 18th century, when reports of the undead returning spread across Eastern Europe. This led to corpses being staked and reburied with garlic and all other kinds of traditions. Unfortunately, I can't really cover that in detail here, but there are some fascinating articles and podcasts about this out there, which you can definitely find. Another link to history from the text is the Morovian man, who assists Karnstein in getting rid of its initial plague of revenants. This was apparently also inspired by real events which took place in Hungary, which was then reported by a man called Dom Augustin Calme in his 1751 dissertation on magic, vampires and spirits which Le Fanu must have read. But let's have a look at the figure of the vampire in Camilla itself. Most of the details actually don't show up until the conclusion, which I hadn't detailed for you yet. Here, in the conclusion, the weird old man who knew where the grave was reveals all his knowledge to Laura and her father, including some of Le Fanu's key characteristics of a vampire. The first thing we are told in the conclusion is to ignore the fiction of the pale vampire, they have, in fact, a blooming and warm complexion, thanks to all that blood. Also, sunlight poses no issue for Camilla, although we aren't told anything about garlic, so maybe that still works. The biggest conundrum for Le Fanu, which he refuses to resolve for the reader, is how Camilla is in the coffin, which is behind stone, but also elsewhere. And so, in the conclusion, we get these lines. How they escape from their graves and return to them for certain hours every day, without displacing the clay or leaving any trace of disturbance in the state of the coffin or the ceremonies, has always been admitted to be utterly inexplicable. I guess even vampires need their secrets. It's one of the most fascinating aspects about Le Fanu's vampire, though, because she has to return to her grave each day for at least a few hours in order to survive. It's almost like a home base where she gets to recharge. We also see Camilla's immense strength when she's able to just grip the general's arm and freeze him in his spot. Add to that her ability to just suddenly disappear or show up in a different spot, and you have yourself an excellent predator. And yet, another interesting thing that sets Camilla apart from other vampires is this deep personal connection she has with some of her victims. When it comes to peasant women, she'll just suck them dry, but she woos and adores both Laura and Bertha, seeming utterly in love with them as she slowly kills them. It's almost like she maybe enjoys playing with her food, and yet you do get the sense that it is a genuine connection for her as well. This love comes through really strongly in the novel, 
and it's something that makes Laura at once uncomfortable, but also interested. Add to that, that Camilla's embrace also has a soothing and drowsy effect on Laura, which can only help her in achieving her goals. A funny thing about his vampires is that Le Fanu says that sometimes they are restricted in weird ways. In the case of Camilla, she is apparently only allowed to use the same letters as her original name, Marcilla or Marquilla. Who made this rule? No one knows, but it's a fun one. The final interesting element revealed about Le Fanu's vampires in the conclusion is that they are created when a wicked person commits suicide, as was the case with Camilla. She wasn't a good person in life, and so she would go on to suck, pun intended, after death. I was intrigued by this idea, but some of his vampire aspects did make me feel a little underdeveloped. Maybe, like me, you wonder why all this explanation takes place in the conclusion, rather than being explored throughout the novella. Well, there is a good reason for that. Camilla was serialized when it first came out in the journal The Dark Blue. This means that every week or so, a chapter would come out. Quite a few well-known books from the 18th and 19th centuries were serialized this way, including many works by Charles Dickens, for example. Now, this is slight conjecture on my part, but I can imagine that as he was writing this story, Le Fanu didn't necessarily have the entire thing plotted out. So as he was inventing and adding things, he probably eventually realized he kind of needed to explain some things at the end. This is also, I think, why it takes us so long to find out the narrator's name. Perhaps he didn't think one was necessary, but then needed one after all. It also explains why every chapter ends either on a cliffhanger or some happy resolution, both of which are immediately undone when the new chapter starts. I do think it would have been very fun to read this in installments. You would have a whole week's time to think about it, talk to friends about what might happen, etc., And the fact that it is a gothic novella makes it very suited to the kind of suspense built by delay. Camilla is a gothic novella through and through. Many of the hallmarks and characteristics of gothic fiction come through very strongly. We have, for example, the setting in a foreign land. Not too foreign, admittedly, but definitely not England. This foreign setting is key because it allows the gothic novelist to explore potentially scandalous and taboo themes without implying that the polite, upper-class British society would be home to these things. In this case, that scandalous thing would, most likely, be the temptation of a lesbian love affair. We also have the more specific setting of a slightly ramshackle, old, gloomy castle, full of empty rooms, mysterious paintings, and more. Something I cut out of my plot description are the very long passages on the description of nature, which is also a feature of gothic fiction. Usually, this nature is described to create a spooky and ominous atmosphere for the reader, or to suggest that things are afoot, like the mysterious moonlight just before Carmilla shows up. I do have to admit that these kind of descriptions aren't really my cup of tea, but they do very much add to the atmosphere. One element that is very common to gothic fiction from this time, but which gets twisted a little by Le Fanu, is the idea that women are kind of useless and need male guidance. The male figures in the novella, Laura's father and the general specifically, are not capable of saving their daughter or niece. They can't swoop in and prevent danger. Rather, they are swayed by the older woman, claiming to be Camilla's mother, who smooth talks both of them into accepting Camilla into their house. While in the last few decades, vampire fiction has been very focused on the hot ancient male vampire falling for a young, virginal, clumsy girl, Camilla also wants none of that. Not only are the novella's male characters kind of inefficient, they are also of zero interest to Camilla. Her interest is solely in women, and her relationships with them are incredibly deep and quite probably sexual. While it is not made explicit, let's not forget when this was written, There are plenty of embraces, sighs into necks, and kisses along cheeks to convey the idea of sexual attraction on behalf of both parties. While Laura is a little more torn and unsure, she is still fascinated by and attracted to Carmilla. One couldn't necessarily say that their relationship is healthy, what with Camilla literally sucking the life out of Laura, 
But for the 19th century, it was very progressive and daring that Laura does not outright reject Camilla's advances. A final stylistic thing I want to mention is the use of frame stories. A frame story is a literary device in which one story, the frame story, opens up or leads into the second story, which is usually the main story. Think, for example, of the Canterbury Tales, where the story of the pilgrims is the frame device, which then allows for different stories to get told by each of the pilgrims along the way. In the case of Camilla, the prologue provides the frame story in which we are told about this manuscript and Dr. Hesalius and an odd narrative, etc. Then, in chapter one, the real story begins, which is told to us in the first person by Laura herself. We also get another little framing later on, when the general story takes center place for a chapter. I always like frame stories because I like the different layers it gives us and how it changes the way you perceive a story. Here, the frame story is meant to make us think that maybe Laura really existed and that her story really happened and that this manuscript is out there somewhere. Even if we technically know that isn't true, it still allows us to sink a little deeper into the story world and to take her first person narration more at face value, which really adds to the reading experience. As Camilla was published quite some time ago, it is out of copyright, and therefore you can read it online at Project Gutenberg. It's not super long being a novella, so if, after all of this, you're still in the mood for more, I'd recommend you hop over there to get to know Camilla more intimately. And that's it for today. If you have questions, thoughts on the book, or recommendations or requests for future episodes, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email at bookcentralpod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. You can also subscribe to be informed when new episodes drop. You can find references to the materials used today in the description. Book Central is written and produced by me, and our music is by Scott Buckley. Thank you for joining me today on the International Express to Book Central.